Hello and welcome to Tyrrell's Classic Workshop. This time round we're not focusing on the multi-million pound exotica again, uh, that will be back soon, but we're focusing on another of my favourites this time. Again a car that doesn't cost the earth, but a car that I've admired and had a soft spot for almost all my life really. And that is this car, the BMW E9, uh, in this form, 3 litre CSI. Coupe Sport Injection, very simple really. These are a surprisingly rare car. Whenever we think of BMW E9, we think of the Batmobile racing cars, and quite rightly so, they were stunning machines, raced by Ronnie Peterson and people like that in the mid 1970s. But I actually, in a way, quite like these. Uh, they're the sort of road going, less potent brother of the racing cars and the CSL for that matter, but there isn't as much difference between this and the CSL as you might think. Uh, but the funny thing is, they made 207 right-hand drive 3-litre CSI manuals, and they made 215 automatics, so already luxury cars were going towards the automatic way of thinking. But the manual car, if you wanted the driver's car that was in this car to be unlocked, the manual car was really the way to go. Strangely enough, we actually have two of them in the workshop at the moment. We have another three litre CSI, right hand drive original UK car. So we've actually got 1% of total production on the premises at the moment, amusingly enough. But the CSI, I think for me is a sort of sweet spot in the range. It was a luxury express. That's what it was. It wasn't an all out uh, sports car. But the three litre CSLs, which were very popular in the UK, the um, Coupe Sport Leicht or Light, was a BMW's more focused driver's car. But by the time they came to Britain, there wasn't as much difference between the CSI and the CSL as you might think. And in fact, they imported 500 CSLs into the UK. So over twice, either this or the automatic version of this. So this is a much rarer car in a funny sort of way. Uh, CSI looked nice, it had the Alpina, the wider Alpina wheels on it, the chrome flared arches, which is a bit strange considering it's a lightweight car, they actually add bits to it, but that was the case. Um, it had the city pack, as it was called, when it came to the UK to help to try and justify its crazily high price. Um, and that included electric windows, power steering, uh, these heavy bumpers, comparatively, front and back, a bit more interior trim. By the time they'd finished, there wasn't actually a great deal of difference in weight between the CSI and the CSL, at least in the UK. But the other thing that they did do on the CSL was put lighter, thinner body panels on, same as Porsche did with the 911 Carrera RS in 1972. But the difficulty with that was it turned an already rust-prone car which all 1970s cars were to a greater or lesser degree, into an even more rust-prone car. And the CSLs with the light front wings and thinner gauge steel were terribly rust-prone and they cost a lot of money to restore now. Okay, we live in the age of the CSL being worth up to £150,000 or thereabouts, but they can easily take six figures just to restore them. So, um, and you won't find one cheap now, a CSL, those days have gone. Uh, but these are still within reach, not the most valuable car on earth. I think the best one, and this is a very nice car, very nice example, the best one probably set you back 50,000 pounds, something like that. Uh, and I think it's a lot of car for the money. I remember as a kid, I used to go to a youth club around the corner from where we lived in Wallasey, my hometown. And one night there was a guy in a three litre CSI, same as this, uh, and he pulled up to the T-junction outside the youth club and turned left. And he floored the car in first gear and the left-hand back wheel spun and smoked for about 50 yards down the road. And I was hugely impressed with this. This was like the equivalent of somebody doing donuts in a, uh, if you can, in a modern day Ferrari FXX or something like that. It was just off the scale impressive. Okay, it didn't have a limited slip diff. I'm sure it was just one wheel that was spinning. But these sort of things on a young teenager leave a massive impression. Um, but uh, I'm just going to look at the, the prices of these cars. Um, <clears throat> I've got an old motor magazine here from uh, 1976. 
uh, which we've had in the family uh, since then. And it makes for very interesting reading. So I, I can see here Bird's Garage in Gerrard's Cross, Buckinghamshire, which, uh, yeah, going back to 1976. Uh, 1975, three litre CSI, silver, that'll be Polaris silver. Uh, blue vinyl roof, yeesh. Um, one owner, 8,000 miles, immaculate condition, 7,500 pounds. And then if we move on to uh, a Porsche 911, Porsche Carrera Targa, 2.7, 1974, genuine 7,000 miles, so not a very different car. Uh, purple with matching tweed trim, gold scroll, uh, sun dim glass, uh, believed to be the finest in the country. Whew. Uh, 7,950. So there's actually, you know, I mean, these cars were um, pretty well uh, the same sort of market value as a Porsche 911. So they were punching very high, these cars. But a great car, a, a genuinely quick car in 1976, 1975. They weigh just under 1,400 kilos, about 1,375 which is about the same as a new Porsche Boxster. So they were quite a light car in their, in their day. Uh, comparatively, 200 brake horsepower. Of course, the engines weren't exactly 200 brake horsepower, but that was the figure that BMW gave. So I think it would be safe to assume they were slightly more than that. They did vary. You either got a good engine or a bad one. There was no such thing as a bad one, but some were better than others. And the thing about cars of this era is, some of them go really well and some of them go quite well. And it's just down to how the engine was built, assuming they've never been apart and rebuilt, which almost all of them have now, of course. Uh, but this is a really nice car. It's got the four electric windows. It's a pillarless coupe. So the rear quarter windows disappear into the bodywork very beautifully. But yeah, they did 139 miles an hour, the three litre CSI which was quite respectable for a 1970s car. Any car that did nudging 140, 150 miles an hour was a proper fast car. I can't imagine the 911 three litre Carrera did much more than that, probably towards 150 miles an hour on a good day, but not a huge amount of difference in performance, less than you'd think. Um, this car has come in for a service but I've actually found something else while the car is in, which um, I've notified the owner of, and we're going to see if we can sort it out. The car has got the, the single overhead cam, three litre, straight six, canted over at 30 degrees for a lower bonnet line. And the engine, the, the CSI, the injection car, actually had the Bosch Digitronic injection fitted on it as standard which developed 20 brake horsepower more than the carburetor cars. So CS 180 BHP, CSI 200. And Digitronic was actually in German Druck Digitronic or Pressure Digitronic because it was a pressurized system. And then the fuel injectors opened under instructions from various sensors and things in the ECU. And I've actually dug out um, an ECU here So this is an ECU from this car. This is a Digitronic uh, electronic control unit which manages the injection on the engine. And the, the way these injection systems work, like modern cars, it's, it's the duration time. It's the length of time that the injector is open that determines how much fuel gets squirted into each inlet port as the cylinder fires. All modern cars work that way, or all, all modern petrol ones anyway. This has got 26 transistors in it. So this was very high tech in the 1970s. The transistor hadn't been around in mainstream production for very long, but this is a sizable, great big unit. This is a rather weather-beaten ECU out of a Ferrari 360, this one that's in the background here. And this actually does the same job in 2001, but this also manages the ignition timing. This is a Motronic unit, a later version of the Boss, but Bosch Digitronic system. Much better system, um, but I mean, difference in technology is uh, quite noticeable, really. So what I've determined on this car is, from cold, it's pumping too much fuel into the engine. The duration time of the injectors is slightly too long. 
And when you start the engine from cold, it's running over rich and you get like a vibrating sort of uh, pulsating noise from the engine and the exhaust system. Uh, a bit like uh, if you go back to a car that had a choke years ago. It's like having the choke too far out for too long. It's throwing far too much fuel in the engine and it actually damages the piston rings, particularly in the engine and the bores because it washes the, the critical boundary layer of oil off the cylinder bores and the piston rings, which keeps everything lubricated and wear free. Um, in fact, so many people have asked me about how do you warm up a car, either a classic car or a modern car properly. Um, and I'm going to be doing that in a separate video in the near future because 70% of engine wear happens on cold start and warm up, 70%. Um, and this car is suffering with an overly rich mixture from cold. Um, the coolant temperature sensor, which is a sensor actually inside the, uh, the coolant in the engine, measures that and instructs the ECU, that box that we saw earlier, to open the injectors for a predetermined length of time. And that is supposed to be preset from cold and preset when the engine's warm, when it needs less fuel, much less fuel to work when everything's warmed up and working properly. So what I'm going to do is check the values on the coolant temperature sensor because I think the difference between cold and hot is too much and it's throwing too much fuel in when it's, um, when it's cold. So we'll have a look at that. I'm going to have a look at the valve gear on the engine, set that up, set the tappets because the tappets on these have to be adjusted. Uh, they don't, they're not hydraulic, self-adjusting like modern tappets. Um, so uh, we'll do that and just have a look around some of the more lovely points about this car. One of the things that I've always admired about these cars is the detail, the attention to detail on the bits that you see, the body fittings and the way it's been engineered and the way it looks, the attention to detail. And this is largely due to the fact that a company called Carman made these cars and engineered the body on them for BMW. Carman were a very well established, they're probably the most prominent German coach builder actually. Um, and they made all sorts of cars, the Carmen Gear VW Beetles, of course, which were hugely successful. And they did a lot of backroom engineering of cabriolet hood mechanisms and things like that. But this was their job. And the way that they've put the little chrome fittings together here and there, it was the 1970s, so chrome was very much in vogue. But it's all beautiful little extruded and pressed sections of aluminium that make this up. Um, it's just a thing of beauty in my mind. I think these cars look beautiful. They really do. I think BMW, it was a gradual process. It was uh, the new class of coupe, as it called when it started with a particularly unpleasant front end, in my opinion. But um, they lengthened it to take the six cylinder engine over the four that it came out with. And we ended up with the first of sort of the shark nose era BMWs. I just think the looks are really sensational. If I was being picky, I'd choose the Alpina spoked alloys over these standard alloy wheels, but otherwise, just a really nice thing. Let's have a look at the injection system and see what we can sort out with that. There we go. Well, we've pulled the cam cover off the top of the cylinder head now, and this has exposed the cam shaft running along the middle here, single overhead cam engine. And each of these cam lobes moves these rockers back and forward, pushing the valves open and closed, obviously at the correct time with the cam. But these are not, um, as I said earlier, they're not like modern cars. They need to be adjusted. So what I'm gonna do, is dig out my trusty feeler gauges, which I've had for a very long time. 
and the tappet clearances on this, the uh, valve clearances are 0.25 millimeters or 10 thousandths of an inch. So that needs to go between the rocker and the cam and that is too loose. Actually, I can move that around. So we put that in there. This is obviously, the, the cam is on the heel, as it's called, the base circle of the camshaft. So the valve is closed. And then we just adjust that by turning this, trapping that, just nipping it up like that. And retightening that. And there we are. Just right. Beautiful. Can slide in and out with a bit of resistance there. And we just go around all 12 valves, six inlets, six exhausts. And uh, that's the valve clearance is done, the tappet's done. And then we'll set the injection system up, try it hot and cold, and take it out for a run on the road. The top end of this engine, being a single overhead cam engine, it's not immersed in oil. You can see there are no pools of oil like there are in a lot of other overhead cam engines. So what it relies on is this thing called a spray bar, which has tiny holes in the other side that spray jets onto the cam lobes underneath as it revolves. Porsche use the same system on their uh, air-cooled 911s and Mercedes-Benz use the same system on their cylinder heads. It's a thing that's really beloved of the Germans and it's okay until the tiny oil holes get blocked up and then the camshaft gets starved of oil and that is absolutely crucial that they keep getting lubricated like every other part of the engine. And this is one of the big bugbears of this engine. They used to wear camshaft lobes and that was because they didn't have a good constant oil supply. So it only needs a tiny bit of black sludge or grit or something in the engine oil, tiny bit of carbon to block the hole up. And in next to no time, you have a really clattery and noisy top end. And in fact, these engine top ends are quite noisy if they're not properly set up and properly adjusted. When they are set up properly, they should be like a, an old Ferrari V12, which is not a dissimilar setup. Uh, there should be a nice hiss from all the tappets as they, uh, as they open and close simultaneously, as opposed to a sort of clattering noise. So uh, let's see if that's what we've got when we uh, start it up again. Well, I've said it before and I'll say it again. It's a lovely summer's evening or spring evening here. Um, and uh, I'm actually quite enjoying just warming this car up, driving it around. It's very smooth, it's very quiet uh, and um, quite settled really. Suspension feels just right. It's not too busy. Uh, the ride is very smooth considering it's a 140 mile an hour car and uh, it's just a good place to be. The one thing we take for granted um, is uh, visibility. Uh, in a lot of modern cars, the A pillars in particular are so thick uh, because the manufacturers, to cut costs, make them out of mild steel instead of a more um, durable material. Um, a stronger material and they do that to uh, just as I say to keep costs down but the, the the problem is you actually have a blind spot quite a serious blind spot here even though they carefully angle the uh, the metalwork um, and this car has got the most brilliant visibility you hardly need mirrors on it really on the sides because you can just see everything the pillars are super thin I wouldn't like to to have a rollover in this car for that reason you can't have it always but um, this is if the modern cars with their thick pillars that you can actually miss a cyclist in are one extreme then this is the other uh, it's just a really airy light uh, place to be big high windscreen fantastic visibility actually uh, and it's uh, just sits on the road nicely the ride is very smooth very agreeable uh, it's firm but uh, 
not intrusively so and it absorbs the bumps that come with modern roads very well uh, yeah it's uh, it's an impressive machine this I've always liked these cars and the thing about them is they really are quick 139 mile an hour um, or thereabouts not that I have tr tried it personally uh, it's quite respectable really particularly as I say for a car that's um, this car is nearly 50 years old now and we do take these things for granted 50 year old technology 50 year old uh, suspension design steering etc but um, yeah the steering is quite high geared and the feel through the steering is just beautiful it's BMW this was the era when they, they uh, their, their strap line was the ultimate driving machine and they could say that with some justification it's a little bit of a tall order I can hear Porsche 911 fans up in arms as well as various other manufacturers but it is just sweet it really is and it's uh, not temperamental at all happy just to amble along bumble along only a four-speed gearbox like a lot of 70s cars it's crying out for another gear and of course people do offer five-speed gear conversions well one of the things that strikes me about this car is the the weight of the controls it's amazing how many car manufacturers overlook the fact that all the controls on a car should be of a piece and uh, the sort of equal amount of pressure to put, push the brake pedal as the accelerator and the clutch they'll never be the same um, but uh, for those cars that still have uh, clutches of course but the the gear lever the steering any of the inputs and the controls should feel the same sort of weight and feel to be that's the sign of a cleverly and properly engineered car and this car does fall into that category um, I remember the first time I drove a Ferrari 355 for all its wonderfulness um, I was a bit disappointed because it was uh, I think the first mid-engine Ferrari to have power steering and I was very disappointed the steering was overly light at speed compared to the traditional Ferrari open gate gearbox for example and it there was just such a lack of um, of coordination between weightings of controls I, I just found that quite disappointing whereas this you can tell there's been some uh, some good engineers at work because everything feels right the steering is lovely just beautifully weighted uh, it's moving just a little bit on, on, on the road surface there in between my fingers and thumbs um, just a really nice place to be the brake pedal feels the same as the accelerator um, brakes pulling over to the right just a touch we'll have to have a look at that uh, <clears throat> but um, it's just a, it gives one a sense of well-being if everything is weighted and matched it's these subliminal things that uh, that make the difference but the car just sits so nicely uh, suspension is a great compromise between ride and handling well I've warmed the car through now let's see if that BMW straight six magic is alive and kicking oh. great just fantastic it still feels quick this car uh, not fast of course but it does feel quick and the way the, the tail just squats down and the nose just points to the sky it's just like come on let's have some fun it just really does encourage you to uh, to push on in this car very neutral cornering Great. Uh, 
uh, during the time of this car and maybe a little later when uh, BMW bought the brought the 323i out uh, I think it was about 1978 79 um, that was a real cracker of a car. Uh, I had a friend who had a, a first generation 323i and uh, we used to go off camping and, and things in it and it was just a great car, that beautiful, sweet, small 2.3 litre straight six engine. And of course this is its biggest brother, but that engine in particular was uh, very smooth. I think lots of motoring magazines referred to it as the smoothest straight six in the world at the time and it, it was. Uh, but this is also still very sweet I mean, there's no vibration through again properly engineered there's no vibration through any of the controls you drive an Audi diesel from a few years ago you can feel every cylinder beat through the clutch pedal you know just attention to detail this car has got it in spadefuls uh, you know even when the engine is extended nothing um, nothing feels out of sorts or as if it's getting ragged or um, vibrates or and it's just a properly sorted car this is why they were so expensive when they were new just a really great pleasure to drive this actually this car uh, craves for the the slow in fast out cornering technique it was absolutely made for it uh, don't want to unsettle the semi-trailing arm back suspension. Uh, BMWs, like a lot of German cars of that era, could get very out of sorts if you started doing things like that. They really did not like it. Because of the sudden camber changes of the back tyres, you'd go from having a full contact patch of the tyre to maybe 25% uh, in a nanosecond, and that certainly didn't help the handling at all but um, this car yeah it could justifiably be called one of the ultimate driving machines of its time just feels right on the road again it's the suspension is not too harsh it's warm the dampers have warmed up now uh, it's taking even modern roads very well uh, it's not the smoothest road surface in the world, but it all works. That engineering, that expensive engineering just shines on through. We'll just try that acceleration again. Just wonderful. It's intoxicating, it really is. And again, the brakes are uh, very powerful actually for a 1970s car. Two great big servos on these controlling the brake assistance, and uh, they work. The weighting of the pedal is just right, the progression. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, now that that fuel injection system is, is set up properly, hot and cold, right resistance values, right injector durations, uh, it's back to its former glory, really. Um, they should always start first flick of the key, cars like this, hot or cold or anywhere in between. Um, and for the nerds amongst um, us, uh, I mentioned earlier the Dejatronic is for druk, is for pressure, uh, because the system is constantly holding pressure and then um, it releases it through the injectors as it's needed. And Elgetronic, the later system, was actually L for Luft, for air in German, because it measured the amount of air coming into the engine via an air flow meter, which had a flap inside it. These days people call them flapper um, air flow meters. And uh, so that was what the Elgetronic was. Just uh, a little aside there. And then in the 1981, I think the successor to this car, the BMW M635, uh, BMW 635, not M, 
um, actually was one of the first cars, if not the first, to have Motronic engine management. It had the, uh, the ignition and the injection all timed by the, uh, by the engine management unit. And I think the Porsche 944 followed very quickly afterwards. But this car I would consider now very nicely resolved. It's behaving itself. Uh, I'm not pushing it at the moment, but I, obviously it does respond to the throttle, etc. beautifully. Just ambling it back to the workshop. Uh, and um, I'm very, very happy to sign off on this car now. Really satisfying job, that. Well, one of the things that shouts quality on this car is uh, the, <laughs> the strangest of things. Um, I've talked before about this perceived quality where modern car manufacturers um, try and engineer quality where there isn't any uh, for lightweight and uh, things like that. They sort of try and make it feel sturdy when it isn't. But in this case, it is proper quality. Um, and that's the door handle, the humble door handle, beautifully integrated into the styling of the car. And oh, so precise. Just absolutely I can actually, I can actually open that with my little finger, with no effort. Just a lovely piece of German engineering. Um, another interesting part is this. Uh, if I were to mention a Hofmeister kink to you, you'd probably think of some dodgy belly dance move. But actually, uh, a Hofmeister kink is this. And this was, uh, it wasn't invented by him, but he's one, he was one of the most famous protagonists of it. Uh, it was this design element where the C-pillar comes down and then kinks forward. It's one of the signature BMW things. Uh, Wilhelm Hofmeister was the head of BMW styling from 1955 to 1970. So this car was in his, uh, in his remit, really. But it's been hugely influential. A lot of cars have had it since. The Mark I Golf, I think a lot of the Golfs have had it actually. And uh, yeah, that's how it all started. And I'm going to demonstrate these lovely uh, windows that disappear into the rear wings, this pillarless construction. Magic. And when the door's closed, it just makes the car, because of that area, area glass house that you're in, it makes it feel almost like a convertible. It's really lovely and open and airy, not like a modern car with a narrow window, big crash padding here, which is obviously very necessary. Uh, and as I mentioned before, these thick pillars running down here, this is a whole different ball game and um, really lovely. Aren't they just sweet? Quite a bit of engineering involved there. Well, that concludes another Tyrrell's Classic workshop. Hope you've enjoyed it. Please like, please subscribe, please share, and please keep watching. See you soon.